which threw me into my meth addiction. Mm. That's after being diagnosed, and that I mean that was the that was the rock bottom. Mm. That photo. What's going through your mind when you get diagnosed? Just you know, um, uneducated about it, thinking I'm gonna die. <laughs> Just feeling like I'm gonna die. I really hated myself. Um, so because of that, I numbed because they didn't want to feel it. And I stayed with men in crack houses and smoked whatever they gave me. And I didn't care, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I needed to get to a point where I was willing to surrender. I wasn't ready, but I was, I was willing because there's always been the spark in me that didn't want to give up. I didn't want to die. I wanted to fulfill my dreams, mm -hmm. um, but it, it got muted, pretty almost extinguished during those rough times. And um, I just listened to that light more than I listened to the cravings mm -hmm. eventually. And I did. I one day the final straw for me was welcome to the hell has an exit podcast with host teddy tarantino new episodes every tuesday at 4 p.m eastern don't forget to subscribe all right hey welcome to hell has an exit i'm your host brian alzate if you guys follow the podcast please like and subscribe you can follow us on instagram at hell has an exit if you watch the youtube video please leave a comment tell me what you liked about the video something you're related to the comments do help the algorithm a lot and if you know a friend that's struggling, you could send them the podcast. Sometimes someone's life story could be the one altering thing that can make a difference in them getting clean. And today we have Bruce Brackett on the show. How are you? I'm so good. How are you? I'm blessed, dude. I'm doing great. It's so lovely to meet you. And oh, yeah, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you for coming. You're from New York City? Yes. Yeah. We split time between New York and the and the Poconos. So what the hell is the Poconos? <laughs> the Pocono Mountain Range. I have no idea what it's that is. It's about an hour and a half outside of New York City in Pennsylvania. Okay. Wow. So you have best of both worlds. We do. So you're living like out in the woods and then you're living in the city? Yeah. Wow. I when love, I when, love your outfit. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, you know. Who makes that? Like, where is that from? This is a vintage piece. There is no label in it. Wow. They don't even make this fabric anymore. But the majority of my closet is things. Like one-offs. Yes, very much wow. so. Um, But yeah, I got it at Screaming Mimi's. And what is that? It's a um, Cindy Lauper used to work there back okay. in the day on 14th Street. Well, I think the mm -hmm. location has moved several times, but it's just a a consignment. It's like a thrift consignment store. thrift store. Yeah. And is it like super popular now? Or oh, just, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, it's been super popular for a long time. And of wow. course, I went in and a lot of people follow me online for, mm -hmm. for my fashion. So I don't like to buy fast fashion not mm -hmm. that you know whatever I, do what you want <laughs> oh my god we're all floating mm -hmm. on a rock through space anyway just have fun yes, um that's gonna blow up one day yeah mm -hmm. yeah yes exactly so i i do i try and find things that are bright and happy that make me happy mm -hmm. and um in return I get asked all the time, like, who who's designing for you mm -hmm. or what? And I'm like, no, you guys just go thrifting, yeah. go, go hunt for what you want. So, yeah, it is pretty cool that uh, you could find something at a thrift store that just does it for you that like yeah. regular clothes don't. And then like I used to thrift a lot, like when I first got clean and like while using. But even now, like even like the art or whatever, like, my favorite shoes, are, like custom ones that like no one else has they're just one off like i just bought like these starry night weird shoes that are just like an instagram ad i saw them i yeah. love them oh thank you i got them <laughs> from my brother and myself it's like a sentiment thing between us but um it is cool to have like different stuff that's not just like yeah in the store yeah have it's, you always been into fashion it's good to be different yeah i think i don't want to mm -hmm. fit in exactly screw that um i yeah i guess i kind of have been um my mom and i uh, as we were sorting through a lot of family photos mm -hmm. that I wanted to be put in my book and in the back of the book in a photo section, she was like, oh, this photo has to be in it. And I'm standing there in like a Hugo Boss sweater. Mm -hmm. I'm like, 
five years old. <laughs> my hair slicked back and, you know, so. Um, and even at that time, too, I was very much into gender fluid, mm -hmm. um, wearing dresses and going when we would go to church and we would have our not recess, but daycare time, mm -hmm. you know, the adults go off and they yeah. do whatever they do. And the rest of the, the sermon and the kids go off to Sunday school and I would head straight for the trunk of outfits. And of course I would pick mm -hmm. out the dress and just spin in circles wow. and circles. So did anyone like tell you not to do that or judge you for that as a kid? Or was that kind oh, of yeah. just, Oh really? Yeah. So I grew up in rural Montana. I grew up in a ranching community called twin bridges and if you're different in any way, mm -hmm. if you're not from there, you're a transplant, you're just, you don't fit in, you're not really welcome. And I am extremely different for mm -hmm. a ranching community. This is not what you get there typically. Um, so I did, I had, I had uh, concerned parents approach my mom and dad being like, your son is playing with Barbies mm -hmm. and wearing dresses. Uh, I mean, even, at a very young age, I'm adopted. And when I had a few of my first doctor appointments, the doctors were trying to convince my parents that I was transgender. And I was wow. like, I was like, even back then? Oh my God, yeah. And I was five. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't in terms of like, we think your son is different type of a thing. It was more like, Medically. your son has a condition, you know? Mm -hmm. And my mom was just, so amazing in her rebuttal was he's five you can't say that he's a like he's a little human being mm -hmm. he's figuring things out no no we think he's trans and she's like he's not trans he's gay and then they would reply well he's five you mm -hmm. can't j and she's like exactly like you shut the fuck up mm -hmm. <laughs> you know well, at least she was cool and supportive very very well, i was very fortunate mm -hmm. um growing up in in my birth family, I would not, I wouldn't be alive. There's just, there's no way I would have overdosed years ago. Mm -hmm. I would not have ever been accepted. Um, still not really to this day. They still think it's kind of a phase. Mm -hmm. like, we're going on 33 <laughs> years now. Like, I don't think this is a phase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how was your dad during this time? Amazing. Super supportive. Too. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, my life changed so much for the better when I was removed, uh, when my sisters and I were removed from our birth home for just horrible abuse, sexual abuse, mm -hmm. drug addiction. My birth mom was hardly oh, so there. How old were you when you were adopted? I was six years old when I was adopted. I was removed at three. So there was three years of foster mm -hmm. care uh, in between that time and And there with was my abuse sisters. going on at that young of an age? Oh, from birth. Wow. Yeah. I was born into detox from drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so I w was born and went straight to rehab, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's how I entered life. And uh, there were complications. I had a double hernia operation from that and chicken pox. And I mean, there were just a slew of infections and everything that I was dealing with within the first year Mm. of my life but i'm the youngest of four older sisters so the abuse was already going on with there them. and they experienced much worse than i did um i keep i'm like when is your book coming out because <laughs> like i kind of got the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. really um so yeah it it was very much rampant and from the start for me and um abandonment abuse sexual abuse from babysitters friends that would watch us while my birth mom was off doing whatever it was that she was doing which drugs mm -hmm. alcohol binges partying traveling with men all of the things um and she you know we all go through something and um it's very unfortunate not all of us recover mm -hmm. i do believe that she's clean now it's taken her a very long time to get to where she is and i am proud of her for that she's not a horrible person she just was a child herself trying to figure out mm -hmm. life with five kids as a single parent and 
being on drugs and alcohol, like that's hard for anyone. So I I have a lot of compassion for her, um, but I definitely don't have space for her Mm. in my life because it's still a lot of, you would have been so much better off with me and I did nothing wrong and just Mm -hmm. the deny. And I'm like, okay, you've come a long way, but you got a long way to go. And um, so that's fine. We can love each other from a distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to talk to someone about that the other day, and they were just, I don't know why you don't forgive me. Da, da, da. I was just like, dude, I forgive you. I just don't want to hang out with you and be friends again. So it's not like I have this hatred towards you. I don't like hope bad things happen to you. I'm not thinking about it every day. Yeah. But like you said, I don't have space for that in my life. And uh, there's so many amazing people that haven't betrayed me and lied to me. And I'm just going to water those plants, you know? And it's yeah. like, it's like, I don't know. It's like uh, sometimes you don't want someone in your life doesn't mean that you don't forgive them. I just not trying to hang out with you every day and And doesn't mean that you don't. Yeah. It doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that you don't love them. Yeah. Or have love for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's just a boundary. Yeah. Did it always, was it always like that? Or was there years of like hatred and betrayal and like abandonment? With my yeah. relationship with my birth parents, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, there was there was because mm-hmm. I would imagine it didn't just happen like that. Mm-hmm. No, there was years of trauma therapy when we were placed and with my adoptive family immediately, they were like, y'all need a lot of help, you know, um, and it, it's true, we did. So there were a lot of years and years of different therapy. Uh, therapists and guidance counselors and caseworkers like the, it was just endless mm-hmm. um now did they adopt you and your sisters yes wow that's cool yeah um so and we're really fortunate because in the foster care system especially with larger siblings they get split up they're in the foster mm-hmm. care system for years that didn't happen with us we were in two foster homes we were removed went to a foster home uh, with she, uh, a couple named Sheila and Bob, both of them have passed away um, since. But they were amazing. They wanted to adopt us. They had a whole bunch of issues in their own personal mm-hmm. life. So if they adopted us, that would have split them up. And then from there, we were only with them for like six months. And then my mom and dad, Glenn and Christine, they heard of our case and were wanting to adopt. And it just wow. the stars aligned and. Now, are they just like old fashioned good people? Or are they like radical Christians? Or oh no, they're, they're just, just they're hippies from San Francisco. Wow. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that they're... makes sense. It's like it's one or the other, right? It's got to be because it's yeah. like rare. Like I've I've been alive for also thirty three years, and um, I never had a single friend be like, "We're gonna adopt." You know, like it's rare. It is to be yeah. like, "I'm gonna go to a foster care and and get you know." Yeah. So I was just reminding someone the other day who reached out to me uh, through a message and she was sharing a little bit of her struggles trying to conceive and and was like, yeah, you've been through it. I understand that. Don't forget about adoption because mm-hmm. that happened to me and it changed my life. Yeah. And just because I'm not of a bloodline from my adoptive parents, mm-hmm. they are my mom and dad. Mm-hmm. They raised me. They like I am theirs. They yeah. are mine. So. Mm-hmm. We need to look past that barrier. Yeah. What uh, was growing up like later on for you? Well, growing up in rural Montana as someone who is, you know, flamboyant and loud and mm-hmm. boisterous and a theater kid and everything. Once I found the theater, life got better. But before that, it, growing up in Twin Bridges was really, really hard. I was bullied relentlessly. I was in fights or getting beaten up uh, during recess or... Uh, one time I was taking a sip of water out of the water fountain and you know, that little like metal yeah, cover that, that's yeah. over it to like have it go with someone. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. I, it's there to protect something. And this kid came up behind me and dropped his backpack on my head and chipped my tooth. Wow. And I still, I wear it as like a badge of honor, mm-hmm. but um, oh my gosh, I, like I've had a, Ziploc, an open Ziploc bag of urine thrown on me. And I mean, the list and the trauma of all of that 
goes on and on and on. But oh yeah, the bullying, not fitting in mm-hmm. uh, because of uh, fetal alcohol effects when I was born. Um, I didn't really form full sentences until I was about five years old and I was stammering a lot and I couldn't pronounce my R's. So the reasons that they could bully me Mm -hmm. was kind of open game for them and they took advantage of that. So especially when you're young, people will find like anything. Everyone gets bullied to some degree. Yeah. yeah. And everyone bullies to some degree. That's Mm -hmm. something that I, I, was playing the victim card for a long time being like, oh, I was bullied so bad. But then I I look back at my own youth and I was like, well, I also made fun of this person. Mm -hmm. So that goes both ways. I have to take credit Mm -hmm. and I have to hold myself accountable for things that I've done too. But yeah, it's also a learned behavior. So it's like, yes, I used to bully a lot when I was young and it's because when I would go home, the kids in the neighborhood would bully me. So I just started doing it to like other people thinking that like, you know, if I do it to them first, they're not going to do it to me or Mm -hmm. I don't know why, like maybe it just leaves like you have some like revenge thing going on or whatever. And I learned that the kid bullying me was beat by his dad and, you know, so it's, it's never like a, for no reason type of thing. Oh no. Yeah. It's not just the mood that they wake Mm -hmm. it, they wake up and. And that's another thing, too, that people forget that it is learned and chances are what's happening in their home. Mm -hmm. Where are they learning this? You know, so I can only imagine. When did you find theater? I found theater at the age of eight. Uh, My mom told me about a audition in the town next to us for the Missoula Children's Theater. Mm -hmm. It's this theater company that really goes all over um and uh so i tried out and i got a part it was my first role as kind of a lead in treasure island called sing sing sam that was my name sing sing sam and every single line i had to sing it Mm -hmm. so i was i immediately fell in love with it yeah and about an hour away from twin bridges is a city called butte in montana with a pretty well-known theater community, the Orphan Girl Children's Theater and the Motherload. Uh, and right after that, it was like, I need more of that. You know, that was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt comfortable and free and I could be someone else. I could escape me and be someone else. And that honestly was kind of one of my first addictions that was healthy. <laughs> uh, clarify, healthy. <laughs> Um, and my parents drove me to all of the auditions up in Butte and I was constantly in theater there. And because of the continued hate and everything that was happening in the school system and the school not doing anything about it, hell, I was being bullied from teachers even, you know, like there was this one time that in sixth grade, uh, the year I came out actually, but the teacher who's very religious and okay. Um, he gave the class an assignment to, ha- to write a report on any subject that you wanted to. And I instinctively would just selected my uncles in San Francisco and was like, I'm going to write a report about them because I love them. I respect them. And they're my first glance into a world of two successful gay men living authentically Mm -hmm. and freely and being successful at it you know Mm -hmm. so i was really inspired by that so i made my report about that and he one day i think i was in therapy we would commute for therapy as well um so that day i was out of school for half of the day and we were all to go up and read our reports in front of the class and they did. And I mean, I found this out years later from one of my really good friends who I'm still friends with. Um, He took my report up to the front of the class with a trash bin and lectured the class for a few minutes about how disgusting my report was, what was in it. If I were to follow in the footsteps 
of them, surely I would be going to hell with my uncles as well and then spit on it and trashed it in the trash bin. And I found out about that and I was like, yeah, that really doesn't surprise me because he punished me a lot Mm -hmm. for just really unnecessary things having to write every single word out of like pages of the dictionary Mm -hmm. and just spending so much so much time being scrutinized by by this teacher um and this isn't like a catholic school or anything like no that. this it's is like a public school regular public school is crazy he was very religious mm-hmm. but no public school um small s- small ranching community mm-hmm. i'm talking about a town that has like maybe 300 people and 300 300 that's it people period. in a town yeah Oh, in the middle no. of nowhere and in, in the middle of the most gorgeous mm-hmm. place on earth, you know, mm-hmm. the Ruby Valley in Montana is just breathtaking, you know, 300 people and like 30,000 cows, like, you know, so mm-hmm. ranching is definitely wow. that religion, church, rodeo, mm-hmm. anything else you, you don't really fit in football, <laughs> the typical outdoor hunting Mm -hmm. type of stuff um so theater really came to save my life in so many different ways and because uh going back a little bit because the school system wasn't doing anything to prevent bullying or even providing discipline for Mm -hmm. when it would happen uh my parents just said enough we're moving to butte we're there all the time anyway because you're in theater and this town sucks mm-hmm. like we're done with this so they did we packed up our well wow. our stuff sold the house and moved to butte where's butte uh it it's about an hour away from twin bridges but southwest montana um it's one of the larger cities it's got mm-hmm. like 30 something thousand people um and it back in its day it was a population of like 150 200 thousand people mm-hmm. Because it was during the gold rush and everything, but Butte specifically supplied the United States with copper. So there's mm-hmm. a huge copper mine there. Um, that was like 1850s in yeah. the 1800s. So um, now it's a smaller city, but it's very liberal for mm-hmm. Montana. So, and then, you know, moving to Butte, and then everything changed. Um, we moved to Butte and the middle of eighth grade after some psych stuff that was going on with with me and i went to an acute unit in a hospital and attempted suicide and all of that so while i was there my parents moved and then i didn't go home to twin bridges i went home to my new home Mm -hmm. in butte and things changed i went to a catholic high school a private high school No problems? No problems. At a Catholic high school? At a Catholic high school in Little Montana. Literally no problems. Like Mm -hmm. my first outside of the outcasts that I had in Twin Bridges Mm -hmm. of like three people (laughs) that were my friends. um, The whole class was my friend. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even going through high school, I was hardly... Heart, I mean, it happened, of course. Yeah, everyone kind of has some type of story. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it was daily mm-hmm. in Twin Bridges. It was awful in Twin Bridges. Nope, Butte was honestly, mm-hmm. looking back at it, I because <laughs> I was a teenager and I hated everything, you mm-hmm. know? So in that mindset at that time, I was, of course, not happy, but I was grateful because I was fitting in. I was kind of... On, more on the popular side whatever that meant for me at that time and it was it was really a, a a relief um and then i turned 16 which is a huge part of my book uh that i wrote of it takes up a huge chunk of the book i ran away cuz i disassociated went down really really poor mental health Hmm. and reintroduce myself while I ran away. Were you taking meds at this time? At like a teenager? I Yeah, I started taking medication. I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was 12, 11 or 12. Um, 
and which is kind of young, but very young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially back b- back then. Mm-hmm. Um. I was on Wellbutrin, Ritalin, not all at the same time, but many different mm-hmm. Stridol, I think, or so there were so many, I can't mm-hmm. really honestly remember. Um and at that time when I ran away, I had medication, but I was going off of it. Mm-hmm. And then obviously when I ran away, I didn't have the medication. But I was missing for almost almost a summer what and yeah yeah i i really did a number on my parents with that one Mm -hmm. um like i was so far gone mentally i wanted to be a sex worker i wanted to be someone's slave Mm -hmm. i wanted to be in that life i just i fantasized about it you know someone can take care of me Mm -hmm. and in return i can do this for them and then life's just gonna be easy for me what kind of thinking is that? At you know, 16. Yeah, at, at 16. Yeah. So I did. I stole money from the candy shop that my mom was managing. And, I st- you know, I took my paycheck and ran away and went to Denver, Oklahoma City, Dallas. And um, during this first half of me running away, mm-hmm. I only had weed, um, a little bit of weed on me so i didn't reintroduce myself to drug harder drugs until the second time i ran away because Mm -hmm. i got caught in dallas now what are you doing while you're running away just like wandering the streets of these Mm -hmm. cities and hanging outside of gay clubs hoping someone will like pick me up mind you i look 16 16 so obviously i'm not allowed in Mm -hmm. and you know still baby face and all of that was there still like a rampant amount of men that didn't care how old you were there were not not at this time but when i would call the like one 800 gay chat lines and Mm -hmm. stuff oh yeah no there were tons of men that were they said that they were into it and then when i (laughs) ran away being like hey i came to your city where are you cold like they're you know no answer um so i did i spent a lot of time just wandering the streets and sleeping under benches and washing myself in public restrooms using toilet water Mm -hmm. and hand soap from the dispenser and I would take a whole bunch of paper towels and go in the bathroom stall and clean myself. And, um, in Dallas, I, in (laughs) the chapter is chapter 10 called angels in Dallas. And it is describing my time of arriving in Dallas and having no idea where I was going or Mm -hmm. like, even if there was a gay neighborhood, a gay neighborhood. So I ended up under this, like, industrial parkway under this high uh, this freeway and out of nowhere this person just appears and comes to me and sits down next to me and asks me a whole bunch of questions like what's your name and i lied and gave him an uh, an alias todd klein (laughs) and he's like no it's not like don't bullshit me kid you know no it's not and like okay no it's you know it's bruce uh, what are you doing here? Oh, I just live around the corner. No, you don't. Like, you know, mm-hmm. that type of conversation. And he just warned me so purely that if I stayed in that park with my rainbow bracelets that I had on, mm-hmm. I was screaming for death and I wouldn't make it out of that park. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took that as a sign and started to collect my things and went to go and, you know, offer him my my thanks but also question him Mm -hmm. and it was just gone so i don't know if i hallucinated this person if i was so dissociated that that happened if i was so tired from exhaustion that Mm -hmm. that happened or if this was an actual human being that came up to me and was like no 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 get out of here you gotta Mm -hmm. get out or it was an angel Mm -hmm. like i have no idea still to this day um but Thank you to whoever you were, because I do believe that they saved my life that night. Um, And the next day, I basically got turned in by another woman that was helping me Mm -hmm. and then caught on to my lies and was like, okay, 
uh, took me to the gay church and was like, I'm going to go get you Burger King because <laughs> you look hungry and came back with police officers. And I was put in a shelter. And the next day, my dad flew down to wow. Dallas and picked me up and took me home. And Are, is your dad angry? Is he just worried? So my dad is a man of few words, I, worried for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but he also doesn't emote a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. But I, I specifically remember him asking me in uh, the airport, are you done? <laughs> like, <laughs> please be done, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we laugh about it now. He's 85 years old now. So he's, oh, well. you know, we, we've had some distance. This mm -hmm. happened 18 years ago. So we've worked on this a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can laugh about it now, thank God. But um, he, yeah, it was a quiet trip back to Butte. Not not many words mm -hmm. were spoken. Um, and I just wasn't done. I lied to him. And two days later, I stole the car, stole some money, and went to Chicago. What? And, to yeah, Chicago? That's I, crazy. Yep. And then that is where I reintroduced myself. I say reintrodu reintroduced because I was born into it, but willingly. Mm -hmm. As a active human being, that's when I reintroduced myself to drugs. And I, if I did my research before I went to Chicago, and I was like, is there a gay area? There is, Boys mm -hmm. Town. And when I got there, I went straight there because I was like, I'm going to find the person to take care of me. And I did, um, along with meth and just a lot of careless, anonymous sex mm -hmm. with whoever they were having a revolving door of parties and whatnot going through their apartment. And um, yeah, that was, that was scary. And you were still 16? Still 16, yeah. Um, now, did these people care about how old you are? Or they- They did not. It's crazy. No, they did not. Now, do you do you feel taken advantage of or do you just not care or do you feel like a willing participant in that time yeah i was a willing participant i was excited by it um and when the drugs were introduced i had no rational thinking mm -hmm. and it was my first time remembering that feeling of being on any type of drug Really, you know, um, let alone like one of the hardest drugs on the planet, just to mm -hmm. go straight there to meth. Like, yeah. Um, so it, God, I remember the first time spending hours. Well, the time that I felt, it mm -hmm. felt like hours. Um, it could have been 20 minutes. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, just gawking at myself in this mirror like shark eyes just n no one's home you know <laughs> like no one's there but just thinking i was the most beautiful thing mm -hmm. on on the planet and um yeah i was really out to lunch and um i stayed with this gentleman for about this gentleman um i stayed with this person for <laughs> about a week and it just became more rough, especially with the men that were coming over. Mm -hmm. And it, it started to become to a situation where I could no longer say no or don't touch me mm -hmm. or I, you know, not right now, <laughs> you know. Um, so I ran away from them and uh, went to the LGBT center on Halstead Street there and they put me up in a shelter a children's shelter and at this time i am still todd klein my alias but because i'm so out to lunch i was british <laughs> um and lied <laughs> and said that i was from london and my parents abandoned me because i was gay and just mm -hmm. you know all of the lies just spewed because yeah is there other is there like a bunch of kids like this at the time that are like 16 on meth with like all these older men or are you like one off no i was the only 16 year old out there and it was just it was i mean in this situation i'm sure that there yeah, are so I mean, many but where you're at now it wasn't like there was a home. whole bunch of younger street kids that were doing the same thing no 
Not not that I knew of yeah. for everyone that There could have been, but you weren't like in a scene with a bunch of other young kids. No. I was I was visibly mm -hmm. underage. Yeah. Um and in my eyes looking back at that, everyone looked much older mm -hmm. than than I was. So yeah, pretty disgusting. Um again, a lot of therapy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be able to sit here and yeah, because like for me, like I was smoking crack at 14 with people that were older than me. And um, for years, I like never felt that that was like whatever. And I told them that I was 18 and like my probably passed for like 18. But as I became an adult myself and like early into like my 20s and like 25, and then I would meet other 14 year old kids, I was like, oh, the people I was smoking crack with are fucked up people like yes th like there is no possible way that th this should go on like no one's giving no. crack to a 14 you know um like someone told me that uh any sex with a child is rape yes. because they can't consent yes and even if they did they're they're kids they can't consent you know so especially when you're feeding them drugs exactly so it's like uh i didn't realize that until i got older where i started to be like Maybe that was a really fucked up thing. Because mm -hmm. I used to think of it as like, oh, I was just with my friends. Yeah. That's I, tough. I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, right? I can see your body yeah. language. And yeah, it, it's tough when you think about it. Cause, it is. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of you. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Love you too. You've come a long way and you're mm -hmm. able to see that. Where those people are just oh my god they're such dark souls lost mm -hmm. unfortunate and they are at the age now that we are at you know roles reversed mm -hmm. and they were doing like so again not everyone makes it and the drugs will just take you down a path that allows you to think that things like that are okay oh normal and, yeah and it's just not yeah, especially when I meet, uh, I'm sure you do this too. Like when I meet my friend's kids that are like 14, 15, 16, yeah. they're just so innocent and like yeah. sheltered and safe and like have no clue like what could go on. And uh, like we didn't have that, mm -mm. you know, they have no idea of what life is. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, so yeah. And I didn't either. I really didn't. But I think the difference that we thought we did. <laughs> we did. We thought yeah. we knew it all mm -hmm. and we're invincible and powerful and, you know. What goes on at the shelter? Like not what a whole happened lot. after there? Not a whole lot. It was a lot of TV, mm -hmm. just watching the news, hanging out. There were some activities that would happen that, you know, the scheduled lunch, mm -hmm. and shower and bedtime type of a thing. Um, but really not much. Um, and then are you thinking about meth like how into the meth are you are you like that was a crazy period or are you like thinking about it nonstop? it was it was one one rough week mm -hmm. um so it was you know a week of of consistent partying mm -hmm. um so definitely the first few days i was sleeping a lot and just coming out of that uh, but, oh my god yeah it was on my mind for years mm -hmm. and i mean for a long time i had to do a lot of work recovering from that um so in the shelter i'm just <laughs> not i mean twitchy and nervous mm -hmm. and you know um sleeping a lot the first the first few days um <sighs> And just continuing with this lie of being this abandoned person from London. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, the court system got involved and wanted to see if I needed to go in temporary foster care and mm -hmm. whatnot, which calls in a lot more of attention to um, authorities across the board mm -hmm. and whatnot and so we did we went to court um and the lawyer i, I really don't know what her position mm -hmm. was i think she was a lawyer um beautiful blonde woman anyway she comes out of these double doors these wooden doors 
I think it was like a retaining room or the mm-hmm. courthouse room. Um, and she's just friendly and asking me a whole bunch of questions about London and curious. She's never been. Wow. And, um, you know, I'm answering just <laughs> out of my ass, just mm-hmm. pulling random answers out. And then finally she gets to, have you ever been on the eye? Or no, I think it was, what's the eye like? Mm-hmm. And I went blank. I had no idea what she was talking mm-hmm. about. And I, again, just kind of skated my way by and I was like, oh, I, you know, I like the area. <laughs> <laughs> the, it, what is the, it? Like a train? It's the giant Ferris wheel on the river. Oh, it's okay. called the eye. Mm-hmm. No clue, you know? Me neither. <laughs> and she immediately was like, you're not from London. What a smart lady. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 I think she knew from the yeah, beginning, like, yeah. this story, none of this is adding up. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to pull it out of him. Um, and she did. Mm-hmm. And two days later, DCFS workers uh, transported me back to, well, back to, this is so nuts. Back to Salt Lake City, which is where the connecting flight was for me Mm -hmm. to get on the plane to get back to Butte. Their mistake was not watching me get on the plane. I did not get on the plane. I went down the outdoor. Back in the day, there was the the E-gates, which you would go down this like outdoor enclosed Mm -hmm. on the Termac terminal jetway thing. So I went down and around the corner and I waited there for like 10 minutes. I was like, she's probably gone by now going back to her gate. So I turned my happy ass mm-hmm. around and walked straight out of the airport to downtown Salt Lake City mm. where I hung outside of this library and this group of people um, took me under their wing. They're called the Juggalos or were what? the Juggalos. You started hanging it, out with the Juggalos? Yeah. Do How you, did you find Do them? you know the yeah. Juggalos? Oh um, my God. Yeah. No, I was just outside <laughs> of, that's so random. Okay. So yeah. I was outside of the library and I mean, now at this time it's like Wait, 10, 11 o'clock at hang night. On, you go to a library and meet a bunch of Juggalos? Well, it's closed, so it's late, okay. and there's this, just hanging there's out like a park out there, and there's a fountain with homeless people what? that are washing their uh-huh. feet in it. And they, I'm on this bench, and this girl, her name was Star, mm-hmm. uh, comes up to me, and she's like, "You look really sad. Are you okay?" And again, give them this bullshit mm-hmm. story. I dropped the British mm-hmm. shit, but um. <laughs> That was exhausting. So, yeah, uh, I, again, told them this fib story of how I'm I'm a a runaway prostitute and I'm escaping the circuit. And I just I refuse to go home because my parents are homophobic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it's been so long since I've seen them. Bullshit. Um, So they did. They took me under their wing. And again, the drugs came right back, smoking weed day and night, um, meth. Mm -hmm. was around drinking was around and i stayed with them for about two weeks um and something happened where can you describe the juggalo culture because i don't even know what it is other like i only know like i only know of the memes of juggalos yeah so the little hatchet man yeah yeah so the juggalos from my understanding of what i experienced with them Mm -hmm. and what they told me is that they're not a gang. They're more of just a street family. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Labels, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, But they worship ICP, Insane Clown Posse, Mm -hmm. the music group, and they're just nomads. And they, you know, fuck the police. They do what they want. Mm -hmm. Um, And... They seem pretty nice. (laughs) Yeah. No. Yes. Um, but Mama, who is like the head of the house, mm-hmm. oh, well, there was like six of these people, mm-hmm. and then including me. And the, again, it was kind of a revolving door. There was no furniture in this apartment, like mm-hmm. a futon, her bed, a mattress on the floor in the other room, and a TV on like a box. Mm-hmm. You know, there nothing there. Um, and which no judgment, you know, people live however Mm -hmm. they live. Um, But 
she was very rough and very demanding and she like she was the one that wore the pants in this group Mm -hmm. of people um but yeah they taught me how to um is it called panhandling on the street where Mm -hmm. you're like begging for money basically and they're like they threw me out there front because they're like we're gonna make so much more because you're a kid and people are gonna feel sorry for Mm -hmm. you so we did that and like they stole from like soup kitchens so like not the best (laughs) of people and they were feeding me drugs and Mm -hmm. there were a few of them that i did have sexual encounters with so again Mm -hmm. no like yeah not not the best group Mm -hmm. um and i ended up getting scared away from them because uh because of this lie that i told them of me trying to escape this prostitution circuit mama went along with that and then one night she was just like so we found the guy and there's a two hundred fifty thousand dollar bounty on your head Mm -hmm. i'm like no there's fucking not like i told you a lie again Mm -hmm. i went along with it with her and um she's like just because of you being here now for so long we're gonna have you stay at my friend Mm -hmm. you can read the book to find out all of Mm -hmm. that information but we're gonna have you um be with him for a while you guys can come back and crash here but you need to hang out with him during the days um so i did and of course we fooled around and got high together and whatnot um and come back and mama finds us together and she like strictly forbid that Mm -hmm. um and was throwing shit and kicked him out of the house and um a two or three days later i find out that he's like missing and not coming back and she told me she's like he's gone and he's never gonna hurt you again and in my head i'm like what just happened did Mm -hmm. you guys did you guys kill him or what's going on so i got freaked out um And another person ratted on someone for being a runaway and they also did something with them. Mm -hmm. Me as a runaway, I was like, I'm out. I I can't do this. Um, So I ran away from running away from running Mm -hmm. away again. And the last city I went to was Las Vegas. And at in Las Vegas, um, I was only there for like out on the streets for 14 hours before I turned myself in and I Mm. went to the airport and turned myself in to police there. But before I did that, I was just roaming up and down the strip coming off of drugs, screaming at the moving sex billboards on Mm -hmm. the trucks. Like, what does your mother think of you? And just (laughs) freaking out and seeing myself in them and being like, I want to be like, what is going on here? So I was, I was still high coming off of that withdrawing and starting to enter my normal mindset again of Mm -hmm. like what the fuck did i just do this summer and so i went to the airport i used this woman's cell phone to call home my sister picks up the phone she's like bruce i was like hi is mom there i just Mm -hmm. immediately ignored her and mom was like you have to turn yourself in first off where are you you know she was like it's Mm -hmm. so good to hear your voice where are you and you have to turn yourself in so i did i followed those instructions and was again taken to a shelter the next day my dad flew down to las vegas again Mm -hmm. to pick me up because he's like i'm not going to trust anyone to transport you Mm -hmm. home because of what happened last time um and i was arrested in the airport in butte for stealing money and stealing my parents car Mm -hmm. and just running away and so I went through juvie and fast forward. I was I was in juvie for a few months and then transported out of that into a group home where I lived for seven months with intensive therapy because of my record. I was no longer allowed in a Catholic high school or a public school. So I had to go to an mm. alternative high school, which I s- stayed at until I graduated. Um, and by a miracle, I graduated freaking high school. You mm-hmm. know, I thought I would be dead by that point. Um, so I did. I graduated high school and therapy was back in theater, was dancing a lot mm-hmm. at Dynamic Dance and Tumbling Academy, Didi and Ta, <laughs> um, and was living my truth again. And 
had my dreams back of moving to New York City to be on Broadway, either as a star or as a, a dancer, mm -hmm. an ensemble. I didn't care. I wanted Broadway. Um, so when I turned 18, graduated high school, saved up enough money, packed my bags, and October 1st, moved to New York City and was legit trying and auditioning mm -hmm. and dance classes and vocal lessons all the time and just blowing through my money doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and the constant rejection and rejection, you're too short, you, you know, too flamboyant, sorry, not the right look, the, just the constant rejection mm -hmm. of that. The one that I'm just like, Broadway, change your vision. There can be a short person who's in love with a tall mm -hmm. woman or man or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, but in terms of Broadway, that's just not how they do it. Um, and what I now know is rejection is not rejection. It's redirection towards your yes. So keep going, just keep going. Mm -hmm. You will find your yes. Um, but I didn't know that at the time and I was a dancer. So the next thing that I, I was like, I can make money dancing at a nightclub. So I'm going to be a go-go dancer. Mm -hmm. And I went down that road and that's like red flag for me because drugs, alcohol, mm -hmm. sex, that's all there. So I immediately fell back into that and started promoting myself as an escort on Craigslist mm -hmm. and started working as a sex worker that way. Again, um, this time of age. Um, and right before I turned, right before I turned 21, it was February 23rd or 24th, I was diagnosed with HIV and um, my birthday is March 3rd. So how did you find out? Uh, I was incredibly sick. Wow. I, it, it hit, I'm sure I had it for mm -hmm. a while and it just got to the point where it was borderline AIDS, um, really, really dangerous mm -hmm. numbers, uh, and everything in my body hurt. I could, I could hardly eat, mm. um, pounding headaches. My lymph nodes were swollen and even at that time i didn't know what that meant but i could feel the mm -hmm. the bumps just being like what the what, mm -hmm. what is that but being in constant pain and then finally i the only clinic that i knew to go to that had doctors even if like in my mind i knew something was wrong but i didn't think it was std related mm -hmm. so i went to the free clinic and that's what it was um which threw me into my meth addiction mm. just hardcore that mugshot mm -hmm, that, that you picture. saw mm -hmm. that's that's after being diagnosed and that i mean that was the that was the rock bottom mm. that photo what's going through your mind when you get diagnosed oh just you know um uneducated about it thinking i'm gonna die <laughs> just feeling like i'm gonna die because mm -hmm. it took me a, a it took me a good month and a half to even start to feel normal again even after being put on medication and treatment and mm -hmm. everything uh and at that time i was on a cocktail which was several different medications now i'm on a one a day pill um so yeah it took me a while to get feeling back to normal and I hated myself so much for allowing myself again to go down a road that was willingly walking towards a living suicide mm -hmm. or death or, you know, the end of it. I really hated myself. Um, so because of that, I numbed because I didn't want to feel it. And I stayed with men in crack houses and smoked whatever they gave me and didn't say no anymore to even if it wasn't cons consensual, I didn't care, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's okay. Yeah, I was not expecting to, um, uh, I don't know if these are like emotions of, no, I don't think that they're emotions of pain. I'm just so grateful that I'm not that person anymore. 
It was really dark. No, I mean, your story is going to help a lot of people. I really think that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I needed to get to a point where I was willing to surrender. I wasn't ready, but I was, I was willing because there's always been the spark in me that didn't want to give up. I didn't want to die. I wanted to fulfill my dreams, Mm -hmm. um, but it, it got muted pretty almost extinguished during those rough times. And, um, I just listened to that light more than I listened to the cravings mm-hmm. eventually. And I did. I one day the final straw for me was I was already in outpatient rehab and I was still slipping here and there. Slipping meaning relapses. Mm-hmm. Um and I I went to go hook up with this person in a hotel on 46th street and 8th avenue in new york and i went in and i took two puffs out of this pipe and i spent an hour and a half hugging the toilet Mm. we didn't get anywhere like i was there for 10 minutes and i was already just thrown up thrown up getting everything out of my system which there wasn't much in because (laughs) you don't really eat Mm -hmm. on meth um and eventually he he was like well this isn't fun like you you've got to leave <laughs> you you got to go home oh, amazing person mm-hmm. didn't even help with like a cab or mm-hmm. call anyone like hey and just that pounding headache i've never felt this pain before my head was going to explode it felt like my brain was melting out of my ears mm. and i could i I got to the point where nothing was coming out anymore, but I was dry heaving. So I would just chug a whole bunch of water just so something would come come out. out. Mm -hmm. Um, And that next morning, that next day, somehow I got home in a cab Mm -hmm. and I got home and I eventually passed out. And the next day I took everything that I had, the pipe, the crystal, the torch, everything affiliated with it and i went to uh i was living in harlem at the time and uh still where i have my apartment not too far from it is the only mausoleum cemetery in manhattan and i took all of that and i went there and i had a little ceremony and crushed up everything with Mm. this rock that was sitting next to me and there was this vent i was on top it was like a hill that was going over the mausoleums uh, and there was this hole, this vent that was going down into the ground, and I just brushed it all down into there. So I buried it and I mm-hmm. let it go. Um, and it starts raining, and I just sat there forever, just crying and feeling this sense of relief. And I've been sober from it since. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, 10 years that's awesome wow uh, um and since then i've i'm also a portrait artist and uh, a visual artist mm-hmm. and i've been painting a lot of paintings and there's this one that i call crystal stuck in the rain and it's the image of what i think crystal meth looked like on me mm-hmm. so you know she's got really sunken cheeks and her hairline is past her eyes, so you can't mm-hmm. see into her. She's very mysterious and hidden, but beautiful as well with the colors and the mm-hmm. vi- the vibrancy of this painting. Um, and I've painted her a hundred times or wow. more. And um, yeah, called her Crystal Stuck in the Rain mm-hmm. based off of that moment. And um, since then, you know, I've struggled with alcohol and weed and um gone in and out of rehabs and 12-step meetings Mm -hmm. and in-person rehabs and then finally here i am and i'm sober (laughs) and that's awesome yeah what has been like uh because i know you've done a lot of therapy uh what has been like some of the biggest realizations or 
breakthroughs you've had with talk therapy? Well, I think, I think, um, cause I've done, uh, cognitive behavioral mm-hmm. therapy, uh, DBT, um, group therapies, so many, I think that honestly, because when I was younger and I was in therapy, I was just feeding answers that I thought they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to a place again, where I was willing and ready to start actually diving deep Mm -hmm. and doing the work, just rediscovering myself and hearing myself because a lot of times in therapy, they're just a sounding board Mm -hmm. for you. And there's, there's some guidance and, you know, depending on the therapist and what it is that they're willing to do and put mm-hmm. into it, some therapists should not be therapists, uh, <laughs> you know, so I've had many different experiences, but um, having the guidance to truly find the real me again, uh, I've received so many nuggets of advice in therapy Um Everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Mm-hmm. That quote by George Adir. Uh, I heard that in therapy. Um, and just the continuation of going to therapy and what that provides to me now in my daily life mm-hmm. is so beneficial. And also realizing that therapy is not just for the sick and suffering. It is for everyone. For sure. Um, and even if it's a therapist that is charging you $10 or a sliding mm-hmm. scale, or they're charging you $500 an hour, no matter what it is that someone has gone through or not gone through, even if their life is hunky dory, mm-hmm. you know, that's almost like its own drama. <laughs> it really is. If your life is perfect, like one, how do fuck you, relate you to and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, tell mm-hmm. me your secret. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't want my life to be perfect. Yeah. I want to be able to be humble and in a space where I'm always willing to learn mm-hmm. to become a better person. I'm always going to be growing. I'm always going to be moving in that direction. There's no destination for my growth. Mm -hmm. I just want to be better than the version I was five minutes ago or 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I really, really encourage it. Um, even if it's a life coach Mm -hmm. or a counselor, therapist, whoever, a friend that you can trust. And now with like Zoom, it's like, dude, you could go on BetterHelp and get a therapist in five minutes. And if you don't like them, you could get another one. Oh Yeah. It's so easy now. It's crazy. Yeah. Same with 12-step meetings. Mm-hmm. All over the place. Yeah. You literally don't have to leave your house to receive mm-hmm. help, um, which I think is one of the gifts that COVID pr- yeah. provided mm-hmm. to us. Um, for my experience during COVID, I entered and got a good amount of time sober from mm-hmm. alcohol, like a year and a half, I think I had before I, I relapsed again. Um, now with the alcohol, so you put down meth, was the alcohol comparably as horrible or was it kind of like this, like in a very different way? Mm -hmm. Yes. In a very different way though. It's sneaky. It, oh, Mm -hmm. she's, yeah, Mm -hmm. she's, my addictions are always in the corner doing Mm pushups until I turn a blind eye and then. It's over. Um, but yeah, alcohol was awful and destroyed me. So ugh, the amount of times that my partner, Teo, threw me over his shoulder to take me to a hospital because mm. I put myself in a chemically induced How long coma. you guys been together? Eight years. Wow. So he, he missed. Wow. Tweaker Bruce uh-huh. and he got drunk Bruce. <laughs> he got drunk Bruce. Uh, yeah, I met him during an off Broadway show. Mm-hmm. I did it. I finally, you know, I went to off Broadway awesome. um, because I got sober mm-hmm. and success self sabotage with me has always been something that I've been working on. And because it was off Broadway and a very successful show. Um, I self-sabotaged it and really, really just drank, 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 drank. Spirits, whiskey, just, I mean, that was my go-to because it was the fastest thing. Mm -hmm. It was like, well, it's not meth. Like, I've never had a problem with alcohol. So 
but I can still get loaded and mm-hmm. it's not that bad. It's socially acceptable. It's everywhere. Like all, it's poison. Mm-hmm. It is poison. You can set it on fire and it will take your house down <laughs> like that. Sure. You know? So yeah, imagine drinking someone that's fl- uh, flammable. <laughs> it's really? kind of interesting to think about. Yeah. It's yeah. like, okay. Uh, um, mm-hmm. But yeah. it And allowing the social excuse that it was so acceptable and is still so socially acceptable. Uh, I, I really rode with that, you know, Mm -hmm. and it, it just, it did. It took me out. I was, I had my own cleaning company in the city. That was like my main hustle. Um, and it became very successful and then not because Mm -hmm. I would show up drunk I would steal my clients' alcohol. Um, I was losing clients eventually, left and right. So it was definitely hurting. It hurt every relationship that I had. Mm -hmm. Um, My roommates, who I'm still, they're my best friends. And I really had the will and grace version of living in New York City with my roommates Mm -hmm. um, at the Peace Pad is what we call the apartment. Um, The friends version of New York. Mm -hmm. I had that, you know? And I nearly destroyed every single relationship there because of my addictions. Um, I'm fortunate they love me and they loved me during that time. And even though it was like, I can't, I like you have to do this for Mm -hmm. yourself because I've tried and you're not doing, you know, they can't do it. The only person that's going to do this for me is me. I can accept the help and I don't have to do it alone. But I'm the one that's got to make the domino effect happen, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So I'm fortunate they're still in my life and I've done a lot of work to keep them in my Mm -hmm. life and to prove to them that I'm actually doing this. Um, Rebuilding that trust. It took forever, as I'm sure Mm -hmm. you know, in relationships that are damaged. It takes forever. You know, you do that one thing. But then you do it again Mm -hmm. and it's just gone and it takes forever to rebuild that. Um, And with some of them, I'm still working on it, you know, even with them following me online and seeing so many successes that have come from that and the successes in my sobriety, just the success of being sober, Mm -hmm. you know, they're still hurt and I don't blame them. I I respect that and I respect them enough to it's it's interesting how kind of the the roles have changed a little bit. It's like you waited for me for so long. Now it's my turn to wait for you. Yeah, exactly. I know. And it's like uh, when I got clean, like I had six months and people were still angry and I was so mad at them. And um, it's crazy because once I got sober, I just wanted everyone to be like, oh, congratulations, and throw this big party. Yeah. And people were like, nah, bro, you owe me a thousand bucks. Like, if I see you, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you yeah. And yep. like, you know, my dad would say he forgave me and he loves me, but then like would make these little comments and then like was condescending. And, you know, even like a year or two, he's like, you know, throwing me under the bus and just like kind of mocking me and like, uh, in my mind i'm like how could he still be mad <laughs> you know or mm-hmm. like or he doesn't love me or something and um i always say this and someone told me and he said if you walk a thousand miles into the woods it takes a thousand miles to walk out mm-hmm. and um, a lot of times i'll walk in the woods a thousand miles and then be pissed that i'm not out yet after five minutes yeah what was it like getting on broadway off broadway off broadway yeah okay um there is a difference um i don't i have no idea (laughs) and it's really it's really stupid the difference Mm -hmm. it's the number of seats in the theater okay so there's two broadways there's broadway off broadway off off broadway really off 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 broadway yeah wow and it's all based off of the number of the seats in the theater but it's at the same theater or is it a different theater no 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 there's so many different there's so many different broadway theaters off-Broadway theaters. I mean, New York is the mecca of that. So, But Broadway is like a brand? Um, <clears throat> Broadway is... Uh, how, how, how do I say this? 
Broadway like what would it be is the top of the world for live theater and performing arts. It is the Hollywood version of film okay. for theater. So like the West End in London, mm-hmm. that's their Broadway. Gotcha. Um, and broad, I mean Broadway. Okay, so it would be like you made a movie that made it to theaters. Yeah, ba- it's like basically in theaters. Yeah, and then off Broadway would <laughs> be me. like. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Basically, it didn't go to theaters. It just went straight to. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's that's a really great comparison. Try, I'm good at analogies sometimes. Yeah, I I, I like that. Um, but Amazon Prime is popping. It's okay. yeah. <laughs> straight to Hulu. Not yeah, bad. Not you bad. know. <laughs> yeah. Only um, on Disney Plus. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's yeah, so. That's, cool. that's so great. I'm gonna use that. Okay, hang on. I'll give you credit. I appreciate it. If you don't, it's fine. <laughs> but um, what was the show like? Your first off Broadway show? So it was called Babel, and it was telling the story of Babel, the biblical story, mm-hmm. through acrobatic and dance movement. So there was no speaking, there mm-hmm. was no words. It was more of a dance acrobatic show. And because Teo is an acrobat and owns a circus, spectacular. Uh, spectacular productions. Shout out. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, uh, and is I there was still a tickets dancer. Tonight? No, 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 they're no, sold this out. This is this is 2016. It's no. Oh longer... no, I'm saying his show tonight. Doesn't he oh, have a show tonight? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's sold out. Oh wow. Um, and oh, he just told me the name of the theater too. Cinema. Paradiso. It's in Fort Lauderdale. You're talking about the one tonight? Yeah. Cinema Paradiso? No? Maybe? I'm a big movie guy, so I know like a lot of the cinemas. I'm still... Well, it, it's a live performance mm-hmm. theater, so it's, it's, it's got 1,600 gotcha. seats. Um, I think it's... I, There's I, still a I, lot of people to be sold out. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they typically do pretty mm-hmm. well. They've performed in over 80 countries. And wow. A, a lot 80 of... 80 countries? That's crazy. Yeah, a lot of their... I can't even list... 15 <laughs> I, right yeah yeah he's uh his company has definitely traveled the world mm-hmm. a lot of the acrobats including himself are world record holders mm. um yeah they've done they've done really great great work that's and awesome. i i always love that i ran away with the circus oh that's so cool i really i really kind of did mm-hmm. um that's what i should have done when i was a kid no i'm just kidding yeah well you never know you're still a kid. You're 33. Why not? Could run away. I'm not good at something don't, like that. Don't, don't, don't. I don't. Re- after hearing my story, mm-hmm. please don't. Please don't. Don't run away. All yeah. Right. <laughs> um, what was it like hopping on social media? And did you think that, like, you had social media, but, like, being a social media persona? Never in my life. I never thought mm-hmm. I would be where I'm at today. Insane to me. Um, so I joined TikTok because Teo told me you should post some of your paintings and, you know, just get a different platform and get double the exposure and mm-hmm. see what happens. So I did. And it was kind of equal to what I was dealing with with Instagram. And then I started to just be me and mm-hmm. share my story. And it just became more relatable. And then I started putting myself in front of the camera, sharing my story and going deep into it. And it just what was the first one that went viral uh the first video that went viral was when i said negativity be gone (laughs) the first time with the fan no it was before it was the before the fan (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i ran up oh no i didn't i just popped my head (laughs) in front of the camera and I was like, hey, oh, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. We're not doing that today. We're not taking on the negativity. Negativity, be gone. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. And it blew up. Wow. And that was pretty soon on being on TikTok. It, you know, mm-hmm. definitely was in the first few weeks. How many followers do you have on TikTok now? Uh, almost 700,000. Wow. That's and crazy. Yeah. Within two years? Three. Three years? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, within a month on Instagram, about a year and a half, maybe almost two years mm-hmm. later, uh, within a month, I got 500,000 
wow. on Instagram. And now I'm at 629, mm-hmm. 630 Crazy. on Instagram and almost 100,000 on threads. Mm-hmm. And so across- oh, you're a threads user? Yeah, yeah, Is I am. Threads popping off? Is that a thing? It did for I me. Mean, you, yeah, you have 100,000. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm at like 80. There's good 000. interaction on it and stuff like that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I used it for like a week and then I was like, this is too much. Yeah. That's yeah. how I was with tw- with Twitter. A- Twitter X, whatever X, it's called yeah. now. Um, yeah, I think I posted one thing and I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this. Yeah, it's a lot. But that was. Are you Snapchatting? No. No, I, people it, are making money on Snapchat. You should get on Snapchat. Yeah, no, I'm okay with okay. where. Yeah, I'm okay. YouTube threads. Okay, so you do YouTube. Yeah. Do you do longer videos on YouTube or you do just shorts? No, um, I do both. Okay. Yeah, I do shorts and I do longer videos as well. Um, YouTube, I really need to get back into it. Mm-hmm. I was kind of going strong there. I've got. 8,000 subscribers, mm-hmm. I think, on YouTube right now. Um, so I I definitely need to step up the game there. Honestly, this last year has been sucked up. And thankfully, I'm so grateful. But all of my attention and energy mm-hmm. has gone to mainly Instagram, occasionally TikTok, mm-hmm. but focusing on my book, How to Breathe While Suffocating. Wow. Everything went to my book. Tell me about how the book came about. They, uh, yeah, wow. Just, I mean, the blessings that come from sobriety are just endless. Um, and because I was pouring my heart and soul on social media, this woman, um, Janine, hi, shout out <laughs> to you. Uh, she reached out to me and she was like, Hey, I've been following you for about a month now. And this video really struck me and I've been listening to your story. Have you ever considered writing a book? And at that time, I had been dabbling in writing a book now for 14 years because when Mm -hmm. I moved to New York, I wanted to share my story and I wanted to write a book. So I did. I sat down and I wrote out 100 something pages and then, well, we know what happened in New York. Mm -hmm. So I put that dream on a shelf and went back to it and put it back on the shelf. So over the course of 14 years, I finally followed up and did it so she reaches out to me via email and i was like i responded almost immediately it was like little did you know i'm actually in the middle Mm -hmm. of writing one and at that time i really was because my followers thank you i love you promoting the book or asking for a book asked and like pushed me and they're like Mm -hmm. do this finish this and so i did i took their motivation and Mm -hmm. in return of the motivation i gave them they gave that to me and I did. I sat down and focused on it. And then two, three days after that email, receiving it um, from Wiley, who is the publisher uh, from Janine, um, we got on a conference call and it was more so like, we're not asking you if you're considering writing a book. We want to do this with you. We're Mm -hmm. basically already have the contract ready for you. Do you want to do this? Mm. And we reviewed the contract and it was, it's a celebrity contract, the biggest that they give. Mm -hmm. And it just solidified where I'm at and the universe and the affirmation of that was like, there's no way I can self-sabotage this. I have to finish what Mm -hmm. I started here. So I did. And it has been a year of, Going back and if first, when I signed the contract, I sat at that computer <laughs> and I just pounded out the rest of this book. I mm-hmm. mean, staying up until three, four in the morning sometimes and doing TikTok lives, Instagram lives, having them be a part of it as well. Um, and I finished it. Wow. And then uh, months and months of passing it back and forth between Wiley and receiving their edits mm-hmm. and from all of the different editors that worked on it. And wow. I mean, the team of Wiley is just mm-hmm. massive and so impressive. Uh, you know, I was in correspondence with maybe eight people and I was like, oh, there's probably like a few people in the background mm-hmm. that I haven't spoken to. So like maybe 12 people are working on this book. No, there's like 30 people wow. working on this book. Um, between marketing, the, the design, the font, mm-hmm. the 
I mean, the different editors, mm -hmm. um, the VP publisher, you know, it's just an endless list. And I had no idea um, how big this really is. Yeah. Um, and it's not even, it comes out April 9th and I'm still not really, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just grateful to have finished what I started. I arrived to a goal, an accomplishment that I've always really wanted to do just to share my story. Dave Pesler, a boy called it, uh, mm -hmm. the lost boy. Those are huge inspirations for me to show up and share my story as well. Um, so now to be at the finish line is surreal. Yeah. It's really amazing. A book is so cool because it's like always out there and like people can always buy it. And there's so many books that three, four years later, something happens where someone else, some celebrity reads it or it just takes off and it just like goes on another ride. And then mm -hmm. years later, something else happens and like it just gets you know read all over the place and different countries and languages so it's cool because it's like a real resource that is always there yeah and um like books have helped me so much in like my recovery that like even i like, can see yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, even like anthony kita's scar tissue book like that's how i found out about 12-step meetings like i was an adolescent in a drug rehab no one told me about 12-step program no one talked about like the disease of addiction and I, you know, my friend had been trying to get me to read it. I didn't know why, but obviously because it's about recovery. And I read that book and then I was like, oh, this is what I need to do. I need to go to meetings. And yeah. that was the first thing I ever read that had anything to do about recovery because I would read drug addiction books, but it would be like 200 pages about drug use. And then it would just end, you know, with like, then I got sober and then like, I wouldn't know what to do, you know? Right. And, um, that's why the podcast is important to me because it's cool to get people's like stories and stuff. That's always going to be a resource. People can always come back and watch this. So it's awesome. Yeah. What else do you want to do? What's next for you? Um, well, there's a second book already that's happening. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, cause the book ends when I become sober from crystal math. Um, and clearly a lot of things have happened since mm -hmm. then. Um, so it's finishing the story and, oh my gosh, what else? I mean, I'm building my career as a international motivational speaker. I've ar yeah, already you speak been, a lot. yeah, I've already been keynote speaker for many different conferences mm -hmm. or nonprofits, uh, working on solidifying one for Best Buy in Canada right now. And I've been invited back. Best to, Buy? Yeah. Like the electronics company? Yeah. Wow. For their for their like diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. conference that they're having wow. for mental health awareness. That's week cool. In uh in Vancouver, Canada. Hmm. So like, you know, things are happening and it's just it's exciting. And now this is my rush. This is what mm -hmm. fuels my passion that I can provide hope and inspiration and mm -hmm. in return it's a two-way street it's not just about me giving or taking mm -hmm. you know it's it's definitely the two-way street so building my motivational speaking career and i'm currently in school through iap career college to become a certified life coach awesome and going down that road uh who knows maybe more books mm -hmm. uh maybe television tv mm -hmm. i'm still a performer at heart so um the options are are limitless really awesome um, mainly stay sober <laughs> yeah yeah that's like the trick first mm -hmm. and foremost yeah all right well i appreciate you coming on the show can you tell everybody where they could find you the name of your book when it comes out yeah well first off Thank you so much oh, for having you. me. I absolutely, I, I, I love you. I adore you. I respect you. Thank you. What you're doing is really incredible. And um, hell has an exit, man. Mm -hmm. It really, really does. Um, but again, hi, my name is Bruce W. Brackett. You can find me on all social media at bwb.positivity. And uh, my book is entitled How to Breathe While Suffocating, A Story Overcoming from 
Trauma, Recovery from Addiction and Healing My Soul. It's being published by Wiley and it's released April 9th of this year. It's on pre-order now anywhere that books are sold. Um, it is going international. They do want to translate it into like 10 different languages. And I wow. will be the narrator for the audio version of the book, which will be released sometime in June or July. That always comes out after mm -hmm. the book is 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 finished. Um, and April is a huge month for me. I'm going to Las Vegas for the Cheer Choice Awards that I was nominated for. I'm a presenter there. So I'm working there and going back to Vegas mm -hmm. to maybe accept an award That's cool. is really weird yeah and cool Compared to last so, time I went there yeah thank you so much for having hey, me i appreciate you thank you so much and uh we hope to have you again sometime i would love to mm -hmm. and i will definitely be promoting you appreciate as well you. and sharing it with the family so yeah. thank you so much hey, thank you so much appreciate you